Thank you all uh, for joining us uh, in this uh, workshop jointly organized by CDS and Department of Economics. Uh, apologies for not being able to come in person, uh, uh, but it's a very uh, important workshop for us, uh, for the CDS in particular. And uh, thanks for contributing. So, uh, and thanks Anke for doing everything. Um, we did all- Not everything. <laughs> <laughs> we did the minimum. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So today, um, uh, 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 this session is our keynote presentation, second keynote presentation uh, by Susan Madden. Um, and the topic is um, use of economics uh, to support the Mary Darling Basin plan. And uh, Susan Madden uh, is now currently the member of the Mary Darling Basin authorities, and she has been in this position since 2016. Uh, she is also the assistant commissioner of the New South Wales Natural Resources Commission. Um, Susan has years of experience working in agriculture and natural resource management, uh, specializing in the areas of economics, policy, advocacy, communication, and management. And uh, she, her work includes. Um, work with the catchment management authorities and local land services, consulting and accounting firms, and regional farming groups, um, and all of which included hands-on involvement in planning and order reform. Uh, she has a lot of leadership uh, role and contribution to agriculture and natural resource management over the time, and has been recognized thoroughly uh, as through several industry hours and achievements. And Susan has a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics and majoring in economics, and also agricultural economics and accounting uh, with a graduation degree in the first class honors at the university and uh, university medal. So um, it seems that as, uh, given the current climate, Susan um, um, is the right person in our workshop to actually give her space on this uh, important issue and uh, facing Australia particularly. So over to you, Susan. Thanks. Thanks very much, Asad. I'll um, just get the slides up. Thanks, Asad, and um, thank you very much for the invitation through Anki to um, participate today. As mentioned, I'm one of the um, six members of the Murray Darling Basin Authority. I, I think we'd also hoped that Philip Glide, our chief, exec uh, chief executive, might have been available to do presentation today as well, but he's actually on long service leave, so um, I, I will be doing that and, and speaking. I guess about economics and its role in developing and implementing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. So again, sorry that I'm also joining remotely today and that's just been the world that we've lived in the last couple of years. So hopefully that will all change um, next year. But if I could just start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands from which we are all joining this meeting today. Um, there are over 40 Aboriginal nations in the Murray-Darling Basin and on behalf of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, we offer our deep appreciation and, and respect to the Aboriginal people's continued custodianship of our land and our water in the basin and the unique role that they play in the life of the, of the Murray-Darling Basin. So for me, I'm joining today from our family farm just north of Dubbo. Uh, in central west New South Wales. So we are just downstream of where the Taubriga River flows into the Macquarie and there's a really significant um, cultural site just up the road from us, which is uh, historic ancient grinding grooves thought to be uh, several thousand years old. Um, so that's a really, I guess, important site to this area, the locality of which um, is called Terramungabine, uh, which is means land of the Ironbark people, and, and that is here on Wiradjuri country. So as mentioned, mine today is, is less of a technical presentation, and I guess more about the interface with, with public policy and looking particularly at the issue of the Murray-Darling Basin 
um, development and implementation of the basin plan. So a bit of an outline of my presentation here, including a brief history uh, and then some of the tools and analysis that's been used in various stages, as well as the future challenges um, going forward in basin water resources. So the outline here is as much to keep me on track, because I think as you could appreciate when we start talking about the Murray-Darling Basin and the basin plan, there are many paths and tracks that we could, we could go down. So as mentioned, I'll just start with that sort of brief history of water management in the basin. So the Murray-Darling Basin itself, as you can see on the map there, it's a vast and diverse area, supporting many people who are all passionate and have various values um, associated with the river and, and, and a need for a healthy and working basin to support those various needs and demands. So the basin itself covers a million um, square kilometres, which is about 14% of Australia's land mass. There are 23 river valleys, um, as well as groundwater resources. 77,000 kilometres of rivers within the basin. And so it picks up three of the largest in Australia being the Darling, the Murrumbidgee and the Murray. There's probably some other interesting facts that are, are relevant around water resource management in particular. So on average, um, and we, we know that uh, Rainfall is quite variable within the basin, but rainfall on average is about 530,000 um, gigs per year on average. But of that, 90% evaporates. Less than 10% seeps into the ground or runs into the river system. And there's about 86% of the basin that contributes virtually no runoff to the river system other than in years of, um, of times of flood. It leaves us with about 33,000 gigalitres of annual inflow to the, to the river system um, on, a per, on an average per year basis. Uh, also of interest is the, the flow contributions of the, the north and the south system. So in terms of average flows through the Murray mouth, um, about 17% of those are from the Darling and its tributaries of so the northern basin and the other 83% from the, the Murray, the southern connected um, basin. So this slide really goes to some of those, I guess, the various values um, within, the, within the basin and in many cases, the competing demands. So the basin is home to more than 2 million Australians and there's about another million that rely on it for their drinking water. Um, as mentioned, it's the largest and most complex river system in Australia covering an area of more than 1 million square kilometres. So importantly as well is its transboundary. So it um, incorporates South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, as well as the Australian, uh, the ACT. It's one of Australia's largest areas for agricultural production, being a main food bowl, producing some $24 billion worth of food and fibre on average per year. It supports a unique environmental habitat, um, critical to more than 120 bird species and more than 50 native fish species and 16 protected wetlands. It's an essential for um, spiritual and cultural well-being, as mentioned earlier, accounting for more, you know, more than 40 of Australia's Aboriginal nations are represented within the basin area. And of course, there are many other values uh, important to our regional economies, including an $8 billion tourism industry. So needless to say, management of the basin water resources is necessary. Um, and over time, we have seen, I guess, the impacts of natural impacts around um, increasing droughts, as well as human uses and values um, for industry, ag and urban use, leading to an overall decline in the health of the system. So we like to show this slide as a bit of an idea of the trajectory that uh, the basin was on prior to the original cap on diversions and subsequently implementation of the basin plan. So over time, there was a, a growth um, in water diversions uh, that if unchecked, may well have followed the trajectory of the orange or yellow line, dotted line on this slide. But after many years of debate, um, governments agreed to implement the cap on diversions in 1995, which limited 
diversions essentially to the current levels that they were at at that time. So that was really a, a halt on or a cap on diversions at the time. It wasn't an assessment of what the environmental needs of the basin might be. But regardless of that, it, it did level out um, the, the growth that was occurring in diversions at the time. So then if we were to look at uh, 2004, the National Water Initiative uh, was sort of a, another major step in, in water reform in the basin. And through the National Water Initiative, all governments essentially agreed to reduce over allocation, um, providing greater water security for irrigators and introduce water trading to improve the efficiency of water use and to generate greater productivity of the water that was available for consumptive use. And this separation of water, uh, of water from land um, and allowing that trade to occur has driven significant improvements in, in water use efficiency in the basin. But the cap on diversions, I guess, was always meant to be a holding pattern and there was a need to look at a more sustainable um, footing for the basin and determine uh, what those environmental water requirements might be. And that essentially is what the Basin Plan sets out to do, which the Basin Plan um, falls under the Water Act, uh, dated 2007. That was a policy in the, um, the depths of the millennium drought, where the Australian government announced one of the biggest uh, reforms, water reform initiatives uh, in, in history. Uh, and that was accompanied by uh, package in excess of $10 billion for investment in irrigation modernisation and, and water recovery. Here's another, I guess, um, representation of the timeline of, of the history of water management in the basin. So it does go well back um, prior to the cap on diversions, the National Water Initiative and the Basin Plan. Um, the Murray-Darling Basin is, is rich in history. Water infrastructure first started with First Nations people, uh, with things such as fish traps, such as those at Rewarana, which were purposely built to harvest fish and um, or eels from the river, with rock bars also used for, for sharpening of tools. Uh, with the exploration by early settlers, uh, we've seen water managed for over a century. Um, but a lot of that early management was around making the rivers um, able to be navigated by um, steam paddlers up and down the river. What we do know is that following a number of years of drought during the second half of the 1890s, uh, which culminated in a, the Federation drought, the 1902 drought, the community saw the need for a water storage to collect the high flows of winter and spring for release in the dry months. So this was the start of, I guess, irrigation and river regulation as we know it today. And between 1903 and 1913, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia attempted to arrive at a workable agreement on the regulation and sharing of the River Murray waters. And that became the River Murray Water Agreement in November 15, which was um, ratified by the federal parliament and those three state governments. And then from there, we saw the construction of, of Hume Dam and many other regulatory and structures and dams um, along the, the river system. So if we start to talk about um, the economic tools for managing water in the Murray-Darling Basin, essentially the foundation, and as I talked about with the National Water Initiative, the foundation of water management in the basin today is that of a cap and trade approach. So the cap essentially represents the total pool of water that's available for com consumptive use. Water is then allocated by water rights, which are administered by the state governments, which create the water markets and allow, essentially provide a mechanism for water to move to its highest value uses. So what's important to note here, I guess, is that the basin isn't, um, it's not a single water market. There are a number of markets that have developed, um, particularly in the, in the Northern Basin, which are more discrete. Uh, catchment or water resource areas, but the integrated and much larger market exists in the southern connected system, which is dominated by the Murray, the Murrumbidgee and the Goulburn, Goulburn rivers. 
And in addition to the rivers, there are thousands of kilometres of channels and pressurised pipes to supply water to farms, which enable water to move to where it's needed and, al and also allows trade within those uh, infrastructure areas. And it's these inter um, interactions between the distribution systems, weirs and storages, water property rights and various water trading rules that have underpinned the market. So I think a couple of points on this slide that are sort of worth drawing out is, as mentioned, it is not one single market. In fact, there are more than 150 classes of water entitlement in the basin. And in total, water trading in the basin is now worth uh, around $2 billion annually. So the extremely variable inflows in the basin create the demand for a market that allows irrigators to purchase water from willing sellers. And the development of the market is further driven by the different demands for water from ongoing annual requirements for be it permanent plantings, so things such as almonds, grapes, citrus, to annual crops like cotton, rice, and fodder, which have a greater um, year on year variability. So this slide takes a look at the, uh, the variability of the system. So water trading has become a vital business tool for many irrigators in providing flexibility to manage that annual variability. So on this slide, it gives um, an indication of the variable nature with the light blue being the Northern Basin annual inflows and the dark blue being the Southern Basin annual inflows. So we do often talk about um, averages in water management and in fact the the annual the sustainable diversion limits are based on average annual inflows but in in actual fact we see significant variation from year to year and within season and and regionally as well what we've also seen is um, major step changes in water reform occurring um, driven by some of these extreme events so as i mentioned the uh, the 2007 Water Act was really at the culmination of the, the millennial, millennial drought. So with the amount of water varying um, on an annual basis, so an allocation to a person's um, water licence, this is really, uh, I guess, administered and managed by the basin states and it varies in accordance to rainfall, inflows in storage and, and how the basin states uh, water rules and, and management of that water in, uh, in storage affects the share to individual license holders. So there are two main types of um, rights traded in the basin. So there's the water access entitlement, which is known, um, I guess, is the, is the permanent uh, license holding and the amount or the share that an individual license has in the uh, water available in the system. And then there are the water allocations, which are the actual amount of water available uh, under a water access entitlement in any given year. So both of those products can be traded and they're typically referred to as a permanent trade or a temporary trade. And if we look at the uh, buckets of water on, on the slide, just as an example, an entitlement uh, would be that dotted line. So that would be, the overall share in that particular water resource and it would remain the same in wet and dry years. But the allocation, which is the water available in any particular season, uh, will change. And you normally get an opening allocation at the start of the year and that may increase as water um, resource availability improves throughout the season. So in a, um, a wet year, you might have a, a higher allocation. But because it's a wet year and you're getting good rainfall on farm, you might actually have uh, lower use. Whereas in a dry year, you're likely to have a lower allocation, but your actual demand for irrigation water might be higher. Uh, and I guess where there is a gap between your usage and what your allocation is, the residual is available for trade to be sold. And if you, in fact, need more water for your crop demand, then uh, then the allocation that you have, then that's where you may be looking to purchase water from other uh, entitlement holders purchasing their annual allocation. So anyone holding water rights uh, may trade these freely, except where there are uh, restrictions typically due to physical constraints or hydrological constraints. 
or other water supply considerations. And the price of water will reflect supply and demand factors and therefore it will vary from uh, year to year within the season and of course across the regions and the types of water that are available. In terms of the size of the market, um, as mentioned, water trade is valued at around $2 billion per year in the basin. And this slide gives an indication of both the size and relative, um, I guess, importance of trade in the basin for both entitlement and allocation in terms of Australian water markets. So uh, as expected, the Southern Murray-Darling Basin accounts for the majority of both entitlement and allocation trades. I think it's about 60% in that slide of the entitlement trade in 2019-20, and really the, the vast majority of the allocation trade. Probably what's worth bearing in mind is that's a snapshot in time, the 1920 year. Um, that was sort of the end of the significant three-year drought that we saw prior to uh, rainfall in autumn in, in 2020. So the northern component of the allocation trade is probably quite impacted there by the fact that there really was not a lot of allocation in those years over that period too. Um, for allocation trades over time. So this Victorian gold and broken prices and the Um, sorry, Susan, I think you're breaking up. Susan? You're muted, Susan. Back and muted, okay. <laughs> sorry, you were breaking Picked up. up and muted. <laughs> Ah uh, dear. Okay, from I'll just see if I can get this from current slide. We're back on. Yes, all good. Okay, great. Thanks. Apologies for that. That's the um, yeah, um, internet connection at work. I think. Uh, and anyway, this slide also goes to show the inverse relationship between water in storage, so water availability and the trade prices. So obviously, the less water available, the, the higher the temporary trade price is likely to be. Now, I haven't included a slide on it, but you may be aware that the um, water market has been under inquiry from the ACCC in, in recent years with a report handed down earlier this year. Um, much of that went to issues around trust and transparency in the trading market. So I guess with the volume of trade now having grown to something like $2 billion a year, it's a significant market. And with that, I guess, come some concerns about the need for uh, a stronger, stronger regulatory framework around the market, because as mentioned, it's sort of uh, can be quite variable because the basin states ultimately have um, their own systems and, and processes for, for managing trade. So with that comes some issues around trust and transparency across borders. Uh, there's also been concern about um, potential for market manipulation uh, and behaviour of market participants, given that there have not been uh, in the water market to date strong um, regulatory frameworks governing uh, behaviour of market participants in particular. So the, um, the review recognised these issues. They did not find any evidence that investors had exercised market power or manipulated the market um, to increase prices, but they did note that there probably is a need for a, uh, a dedicated water market um, authority that 
is needed to monitor this practice over time and to build transparency and ultimately uh, water users' confidence in the integrity and the fairness of basin water market. As mentioned, the ACCC handed that uh, report down earlier this year and the government is still working to provide a response to that. And they have just um, announced a, a technical panel formed full of, I think, a combination of sort of economists and industry and, and irrigator market um, participants to help the government, government uh, inform their response to the ACCC's recommendations and in particular, uh, look at the implementation roadmap for uh, some of those recommendations. So that brings me on to economic analysis, I guess, to support the development of the basin plan itself. So water trading, if you like, did exist prior to the basin plan, although it is a, a key component of it. And, and as mentioned, that cap and trade approach is sort of the foundation of, of, of water management. But the basin plan itself uh, falls under the Water Act 2007 uh, legislation, but wasn't actually passed in its own right till November 2012. And I think I saw in the media just the last couple of days, it was the nine year anniversary of the Basin Plan um, being adopted in, in the federal parliament or tabled in the federal parliament. And so it was adopted with bipartisan support uh, and it provides for the integrated management of the basin's water resources. Probably the most fundamental component of the basin plan is the establishment of the sustainable diversion limits. Um, and then there's also requirements for uh, consistent water resource planning across basin states. So essentially uh, ensuring that the state-based water plans um, become accredited by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the Federal Water Minister, um, and then form part of federal legislation. Environmental watering, groundwater management, water trading rules and addressing constraints within the, around delivery within the river system um, are the key components of the basin plan. So the sustainable diversion limits. Um, as mentioned, we sort of do, despite the variability, tend to work on average annual flow uh, volumes and, and limits. And the average annual flow is estimated at about that 33,000 gigalitres per year. Of that, prior to the basin plan, uh, water extraction um, from the basin's rivers was estimated at 13,623 gigalitres per year and that was largely a reflection of the, the cap on diversions in the, in the early to mid 1990s. So the basin plan then went through a process of trying to establish what might be a more sustainable diversion limit um, and looking at what were the environmental watering requirements of key environmental assets across the basin. And the figure that resulted from that process uh, was 10,873 gigalitres would be the new sustainable diversion limit, which required a reduction from the current usage levels of 2,750 gigalitres. So that was water that needed to be recovered for the environment. A key component of what was ultimately agreed between governments in finalising the basin plan was what is called as the SIDLAM or the SDL adjustment mechanism. So that's a process that tries to essentially minimize some of the social and economic impacts that would be associated with recovering that volume of water, which equates to about 20, a 20% 20 reduction um, in consumptive use. So the sust sustainable diversion limit adjustment mechanism is made up of two components being supply projects and efficiency projects, where supply projects essentially are projects that can be put forward and agreed by state governments that ultimately try to achieve the same environmental objectives and outcomes uh, using less water. And some of the perhaps more controversial ones that you might have heard about are things like reconfiguration of the Menindee Lakes uh, and addressing 
constraints in the River Murray system, which would mean that it would allow for more natural flooding to occur again along the river, which would have, I guess, implications for infrastructure and landholders um, who have built along the, the floodplain um, over the last century or so. And then the other component is uh, the 450 gigalitres, which is referred to as efficiency project. So this is where more water can be recovered for the environment. Um, so through efficient uh, infrastructure measures often as well, but it, they are deemed to have a neutral social and economic impact. And so if that were to be achieved, that would actually bring the total volume of water uh, recovery to be equivalent to about 3,200. So in developing the draft basin plan itself, there was, and this goes back prior to my time on the authority, but actually at the time I was working for a um, regional water user group here in the Macquarie Valley. So certainly familiar with, I guess, the initial guide and, the, and then the subsequent development of the, the basin plan and I guess the outcry um, that occurred around that from many regional communities and the irrigation industry. But in developing it, the NDBA did undertake comprehensive economic assessment of water recovery scenarios, focusing on a scenario at that time, which was 2,800 gigalitres, which is around about where the final um, plan number fell. And it was based on commissioning uh, 22 separate studies over the period of 2010 to 2012, estimating impacts of basin plan water recovery scenarios on jobs, um, economic growth through growth, um, gross regional product and irrigated agriculture production through the gross value of irrigated agriculture production. Part of that work did look at um, 12 local government area scale case studies to inform uh, the, the decisions that were made about setting the SDL. So to summarise the results of that work, um, it was estimated, I guess, that the overall impacts of the basin plan at the basin scale would be modest uh, with a reduction in the gross regional product of less than 1%, which was considered to be more than offset by growth in other sectors. Uh, in terms of gross value of irrigated ag production, that was also assumed to be less than 1% in the long term. But there was assumed to be a loss of jobs of around 200 per year across the basin. But again, that was considered to be offset by new jobs um, in other sectors in the basin. So historically, ag productivity in the basin had increased by 3% annually, and that was assumed to be able to be returned when the basin plan was fully implemented. Now, as I said, that was the overall impacts at the basin scale. And there were some communities where the impacts uh, were seen to be felt more greatly than in others, and those tended to be in smaller um, communities, probably with, with less uh, economic diversity, and where they were more dependent on the irrigated agricultural sector. Um, and I guess this slide goes to the controversy that surrounded, um, in particular, the release of the guide to the basin plan, and really in many degrees, controversy um, still surrounds implementation of the Murray Darling Basin Plan. It, it is a contested space. This photo was that the infamous burning of the draft um, guide to the Basin Plan in October 2010 in the Griffith community, which, of course, the Griffith community is a, a purpose built irrigation community, um, highly dependent on the sector, but um, actually quite also a, a thriving um, community in, in its own right. But they, I guess, rightly had quite significant concerns about what the basin plan and its implementation would mean to their community. Um, what has actually happened over that period of time and acknowledging that this chart only goes to the 2017-18 year, but this does show the gross value of irrigated agricultural production across the basin. Um, and it, go, it does highlight again the variability in water availability, which of course does have an impact annually on the gross value of irrigated ag production, but we do still see a slight trend upwards um, following implementation of the basin plan. 
And the bar chart does show, I guess, some of the impacts at the commodity level. So I think overall we're seeing across the basin um, an increase in fruit and nuts. So we hear a lot about um, almond plantations in, in parts of the River Murray system. Uh, and that is offsetting to a large degree some of the decline in our annual um, uh, industries that might have a, I guess, a lower return per megalitre, such as um, rice and um, probably dairy is, is a bit squeezed in the current operating environment as well. So in terms of how the economics, the economics of water recovery, so how that 2,750 gigalitres or the 3,200 gigalitres with the SDL adjustment mechanism um, is recovered. There are two tools for water recovery and, and it's probably important to think about who does what in, in the basin management space here as well. So the Murray-Darling Basin Authority is charged with developing that plan for integrated whole of basin water management and making decisions around what the sustainable diversion limit should be. But it's actually the, the Commonwealth Government through the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment that is responsible for working with the state government and directly through their own projects to uh, recover the water, the water required for recovery. And so that has tended to be done through di direct purchase of water entitlements from irrigators referred to as buybacks. Uh, or through efficiency projects. And those efficiency projects have happened at both the on-farm and the uh, infrastructure operator or the delivery scheme um, scale. And that's where they've been able to implement uh, efficiency projects with funding from the government to do so and to take a share in the water savings. So those, um, that, Sharing the savings has typically been split 50-50 between government and the irrigator or the irrigation scheme participating in those projects. So I guess in the economics field, this is another area that um, where there is some debate around. Uh, direct purchase tends to be significantly cheaper than infrastructure upgrades, but there are pluses and minuses of both approaches. And, Certainly politically, there has been much pressure on government to try and put through infrastructure projects where possible, because that seemed to um, provide addition, additional stimulus to communities otherwise impacted by implementation of the plan. Um, and also to, I guess, reduce uh, what's seen as flow on impacts to beyond the farm level, so beyond those participating in the project, but flow on impacts from lowering consumptive use to uh, other businesses in regional communities along the, the supply chain. So in terms of considering the impacts of those approaches, there's probably been one um, detailed assessment of economic impacts of both direct purchase and uh, infrastructure projects. And that's been a comprehensive study that was done um, by Marsden Jacobs focusing on the Murrumbidgee irrigation area. And it found that overall impact on jobs and regional economies from recovery was benign um, and in some cases positive with stimulus from infrastructure investment offsetting any reductions from uh, reductions in um, production from a reduced consumptive pool. And in the case of direct buybacks, I think there's often a view that money, you know, from local irrigators uh, that they've received through selling their water entitlement, there's a view that they might pack up and leave that community and move to the coast. But I think what's often been found is it, it helped farmers to reduce debt um, or retire early. And, um, you know, in some cases, they only sold off part of their irrigation entitlement, so they were able to essentially um, keep them in business with much of that, those proceeds going back into the local economy. So as mentioned, this was probably one of the only studies that analyzed the full impacts of the recovery on the, on the economy. So using a, a CGE model to do that. And the results that were found were essentially counter to the narrative that 
um, is often heard around basin plan causing economic harm. There are a number of other partial analysis that have been completed along the way. Uh, there's some that have been irrigation industry specific studies. Um, I guess sometimes there's a view that these might be seen to overestimate the economic impacts to industry. There's also been a number of studies around water trade dynamics and markets to show that water is moving to highest value uses. Uh, studies particularly from ABARES on the price impacts of water recovery. So we would think that by taking 20% out of the consumptive pool, increase, you're decreasing supply. So you would expect a, um, an effect on uh, prices to see prices increase. And that has been found to be true, but uh, there are also other factors influencing um, price increases, including drought and essentially changed um, demand patterns as we do move to crops that return a higher uh, dollar per megalitre than perhaps the more traditional uh, irrigated ag crops in the basin. It's also been studies that have uh, gone to the rebound effect. So this has found that particularly where water has been recovered through infrastructure investments, um, I guess the improved efficiency and the ability to have probably have some capital freed up from having government invest in, 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 the, in the efficiency project has allowed some areas um, to actually there, increase their area of irrigated land. Uh, and then there have been those other ones around um, farm surveying and looking specifically at the impacts of buyback. And there's an example there from the University of Adelaide showing that buybacks um, have been good for uh, the individual farmer who participated in the scheme. So I'll go now just to the, um, I guess they've been studies that have been done around the development of the basin plan and those key tools around how water is recovered. But since the plan has been implemented, there have been another couple of key steps that the MBDA itself has taken a look at. One of those being the Northern Basin Review and this occurred not very long after I joined the authority and this resulted in a decision that was made to reduce the amount of water that was required to be recovered from the Northern Basin. And this approach sat within, I guess, what was called a triple bottom line framework where evidence was needed around the environmental requirements of key assets in the Northern Basin, um, looking at the hydrology and trying to bring in me uh, metrics or indicators to consider the economic, social and economic impacts as well. So it was quite deep, the work was quite detailed in the sense that it went down to a scale that hadn't previously been able to be achieved. So almost down to the, the regional town um, within catchments. But in doing that, um, I guess that going to that scale, the, the model itself was quite simplistic. So it really resulted in reduced water entitlements equals a reduced irrigated area, um, meaning there'll be an impact on jobs. That approach did, however, have quite considerable buy-in from the local communities in those processes, um, because in many cases, the, the data was able to be ground truthed with um, information that communities had themselves collected over time, and then they could see what they, I guess, um, a reflection of what they thought were the actual job imp impacts which were happening in those communities. So that approach was carried on to the, um, the 2017 Basin Plan uh, evaluation. From, I guess, an economic purist um, point of view, that model was criticised by expert economists. Um, in particular, it wasn't considered to be based on economic theories of human behaviour and, and considering issues like adaptation and substitution. And it also wasn't considered to take account of the, the rebound effect that I mentioned earlier. So it didn't consider the flow and benefits of infrastructure investment and buyback receipts back into, um, into the regional economy or potential growth in, in other sectors. So that brings me to more recently, so the 2020 Basin Plan evaluation. And this came just three years after that work that was done for the Northern Basin Review and the 2017 evaluation. Um, in the meantime, there were many other inquiries um, and reports that have been commissioned around the impacts of the Basin Plan. So 
in the 2020 Basin Plan evaluation, the MDBA essentially, um, I guess, didn't undertake any particularly new work at that stage, given what was already occurring um, through other review, other inquiries or the recent um, work that it commissioned as part of the Northern Basin Review and the 2017 Basin Plan. So it took a more holistic approach and just looked at reviewing and synthesizing existing data. One of the significant pieces of work that was um, taking place at the time is referred to the Sefton Review, and that was an independent panel that the then Federal Minister for Ag, David Littleproud commissioned um, to look at the social and economic conditions of the basin. So a lot of what came out of the 2020 basin plan recognised the complexity of impacts of the basin plan um, amongst the many other changes that basin communities and economies um, are going through. So I guess it found that there are challenges, significant challenges in attributing impacts um, specifically to the basin plan itself. But what we were able to see was that, you know, it has contributed to some positive social, economic and cultural shifts across the basin. But similarly, um, there have been issues in distribution of those impacts and there are some communities that have um, been impacted adversely as a result of implementation of the basin plan. Uh, and ultimately, it did reinforce the need for, um, I guess, better socioeconomic data um, collection and monitoring uh, to help us in understanding the impacts of implementation of the Basin Plan at the regional level, which could then be used to help governments target um, adjustment to help those communities that are struggling more than others. So I'll just close out, I guess, just to allow a little bit of time for questions. As I said, this um, is a topic that you could go down many paths and talk for a very long time on. But I guess part of the evaluation and just the world that we're living in today, we, we recognise that the threat of climate change to basin economies is, is very real and is something that will be needed to be considered going forward. And at this stage, there isn't a lot of research around that. But we have seen some work coming out of ABARES, which projects that where we, you know, might have over a long-term average seen temporary trade prices at around $100 per meg or more, we're expecting to see that um, that might be at least doubled under future um, scenarios in a, in a drying climate, which makes some of those, I guess, industries or businesses that had operated at that, that level, um, it may well call into question their viability in, in the future. Uh, and probably key to that is, um, helping to provide this information to water users so that they're able to make their own um, decisions and, uh, and adapt to that future going forward. So I guess if I can summarise, while we have looked at past work focusing on um, measures of employment, gross value of irrigated ag production and gross regional production and um, productivity, and there's quite a lot of information around the water market itself, um, the focus has very much been on, on impact assessment. And what we're seeing is that there is less work, um, particularly at the scale needed to inform decisions around um, implementing sustainable diversion limits at the valley level. Um, there's less work on what the benefits might be. So some of that, um, the valuing ecosystem services, um, looking at community adaptation, resilience and outcomes for First Nations. And so that's something that of course is particularly relevant, I think, to the discipline of environmental economics. So as part of that, the, um, the authority has identified a number of priorities for the future and that's implementing the Basin Plan as is with a, a review coming up of the Basin Plan in 2026. And so some things that need to be done to make sure that we've got information available for those decision makers at that point in time. And so particularly around social and economic outcomes, I guess the MDBA has committed to working collaboratively with the Australian government, with experts, the research community to improve social, economic and cultural data that's available for collection and analysis to form future um, reviews and evaluations of the Basin Plan. And so to that end, um, we look forward to working with the research community and 
in trying to bring that information um, to the fore and to make that information available to communities to inform their decision making as well. So I will leave it at that. I'll, thanks again for the opportunity to provide an overview and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Suzanne, for, for very interesting and a comprehensive presentation on my running business plan. We have all, uh, six, seven minutes left. So in the interest of time, can I ask uh, the audience uh, and probably Anke, if you could actually uh, moderate from your end, thanks. Yeah, so I have one question here. <laughs> Thank you for the talk, it was quite interesting. Um, so I'm about, 10 years out of date on some of the debates about water markets in Canada. But about 10 years ago, there was a, a when there was a discussion about increasing water markets in part of the country, people would point to the Murray Darling Basin and there was a network of uh, essentially community and environmental organizations that were very opposed to water markets and were very organized to try to oppose their expansion. And I'm curious what has been sort of the similar politics in Australia, has there been, much opposition to water markets based on sort of opposition about the idea of a price being applied to water? Has the opposition been more like, we're not opposed to the market idea in principle, but we're opposed to particular aspects of the plan? How has the sort of idea of having a water market been received here? Uh, yeah, there's certainly, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, there certainly does remain considerable angst amongst some members of the community around a water market. And in my experience as a member of the Murray Darling Basin Authority, it's it's often wrapped up in opposition to the implementation of the basin plan itself. But in fact, um, water markets and, and trade have uh, occurred regardless of implementation of the basin plan. It just goes to that, I guess, general underlying approach to have a cap and, and, and trade system. Um, so there are some who would preferably go back to um, when water and land rights were not separated. Um, and then there are the others who have quite legitimate concerns around, well, we have this market, it's now grown to this size, and it's there are some issues around regulation of, of market participants um, and concerns, you know, that overseas super companies are buying up all the um, all the allocation for speculative purposes and the idea that you know maybe some brokers and large players aren't behaving in the way that they should be and that was largely what triggered um, quite a major review by the, the ACCC into the um, the operation of the market and so as I said while they didn't find evidence of that behavior they certainly found a need to improve the regulation around the market and increase transparency and, and therefore trust in the market. Um, thank you, Susan. I also, first of all, thank you for your great talk. Um, I also have a question regarding the interaction between groundwater and surface water and the, the kind of approach that the, the most recent plan is taking in, in managing both of them jointly. And connected to the question, uh, one about water efficiency, um, because if you make your infrastructure more water efficient, less leaky pipes and so forth, it means that less water is actually going back into the ground. Uh, and so it's not, it's not a pure water saving in that sense. That's what I've heard anyway. So if you could comment on that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. I guess in terms of groundwater and surface water, the, the basin plan um, provides for management and um, water resource planning arrangements for both. Um, and I think prior to the basin plan, we'd seen in some cases where there was high connectivity, almost the ground and surface water plans covered within the one planning instrument. They have been separated out, which has caused some concern as to whether or not the connectivity issues are being appropriately considered, but the requirement under the basin plan water resource planning approach um, means that each have to consider, um, give consideration to connectivity issues. So um, it, it is addressed and it's through those state-based um, water plan, water management plans that are put forward um, to the MDBA and recommended to the Federal Water Minister for accreditation to ensure that they are aligning um, and giving appropriate consideration to those issues of connectivity. Um, in terms of the question around impacts of efficiency projects on 
on recharge. Um, I should have reviewed that work knowing that that would likely be a question because that is um, has been, as you say, one of the areas of contention around the efficiency project. So the MDBA actually convened a panel of experts, including um, hydrologists, to look at that um, issue in particular, and I can point you to the outcomes of that work. But it did find that overall through those processes that um, the impacts that some people were suggesting around that were in fact, um, I guess, over, overstated and that the uh, impacts on recharge hadn't, weren't considered to be material from that, from that program. But I can certainly provide you um, the outcomes of that uh, technical group who were put together to, to review that work. Thank you. I have a question. So it's um, a little bit different. <laughs> In relation to the climate change, it seems that the climate change is going to have impact on this plan. And in particular, you know, the demand for water is likely to increase because of the temperature increase. <clears throat> of course, a lot of things are uncertain in terms of the modeling and other issues that we see actually. So in uh, from the uh, Mari Darling Basin Plan, do you have any uh, kind of estimate in terms of the um, uh, climate change that is for, uh, giving us a challenge and also in terms of the uh, government commitment uh, to the net zero emission, what are the th things going on in the plan? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Asad. Um, I guess in terms of the, the level of that impact, there's not been uh, a model or a scenario that's been settled on yet from the point of the MDBA, but certainly recognising it as a major issue going forward in the lead up to um, future evaluations and, and reviews of the basin plan. And so uh, the MDBA just in the last um, 12 months has developed, um, you know, tried to call in various uh, state governments, uh, industry, uh, technical experts to look to putting together a, a work program and a, um, an a, approach to better include climate change projections going forward. I think, um, I guess, as the plan stands at the moment, uh, adaptation becomes through the water market itself. And also the fact that the basin plan sets aside water that wasn't previously available for environmental purposes. And in doing that, it's done that by recovering water that was otherwise um, irrigator entitlement. So it's subject to those same variations as, so if, if it's a dry year and um, there's less water being allocated to both industry and environmental concerns. So it's about trying to share that risk more equitably. Um, but the basin plan has, was developed on a historical um, modeling uh, sequence. So the period 18, nine, to about 2009. So while it accounts for variability within that range, it hasn't yet projected the modeling that we might um, land on for going forward under a, um, a scenario with climate change. So yeah, watch this space, certainly recognized as an issue and, and some active work going on about how that can be um, better, uh, I guess, modeled and informing decisions going forward. I guess we are over time now. Um, is there any more questions? Uh, yeah, yes. okay. Let's go, Anke. Yeah, I had a question. Um, thanks, Susan. That was really interesting. Um, I've been wondering, and I'm not sure if uh, it's the best question to ask, but I've been wondering what happened in 2019, especially with like, well, with kind of all of the newspaper articles that we saw about dead fish and so on in the Murray Darling. Um, and like, because with the, I guess that, that uh, is tied to the entitlements and the allocations, but um, that, yeah, how did that eventuate? And then like, is there anything that could be learned from that going forward? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, one of those things that quite rightly <laughs> gained a, a lot of attention at the time. So uh, again, uh, one of the responses from government and, and the MDBA was to, pull together some experts pretty, pretty quickly to try and unpack a little bit around what had happened. And so if we think about 2019, that was also at the end of a 
quite significant um, dry period in, in the northern basin. So, of course, flows from the northern basin of what feed into the Menindee Lake system. So there was need to consider the impacts of natural um, drought period with also the impacts of development and diversions um, on the, those fish kills. So while they weren't able to unpack exactly what that contribution was from each, um, it was shown that, of course, all of those things were, were impl impacting outcomes there. So it goes a little bit back also to the idea around managing um, the river system on a long-term average base and where, uh, basis when in fact we see um, high variability um, within and between seasons. So some of the um, work from the Northern Basin Review, which hopefully will go some way to um, helping solve some of the, address some of those problems, um, go to what were called toolkit measures. So they're um, factors outside of just the blunt instrument of sustainable diversion limits. And they're trying to look at other um, complementary, if you like, environmental works and measures that can be done on the river systems to uh, improve event-based management rather than just the average, as well as infrastructure. So things like improving fish passage, um, uh, addressing issues around weirs and barriers and, and the system. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was sort of a, a quite a significant event that, uh, again, prompted some additional government investment in some other complementary measures to help implement the, the basin plan. Hi, Susan. Um, great presentation. Just a quick question. Um, I'm just sort of interested in um, if there were any compensation with the, the basin plans. So you were saying earlier, um, people lost their jobs and um, this was likely offset and there was a, um, a net welfare gain for society. So in just in terms of like a Pareto improving outcome, was there any compensation for these people or like a redistribution plan for the winners and losers? Or... Yeah, yeah. So again, really good question. And that um, I guess in part goes to the water recovery tool. So the direct buyback or the um, efficiency Project. So I think prior to the water initiative, when um, people's water rights weren't secured in perpetuity, governments could just um, cut back, I guess, entitlement and allocation without any compensation. But that process meant that if that was to happen going forward, that there, there would be adjustment provided. And so direct buyback, I guess, was one way of paying the market price to an irrigator for giving back, um, or not giving back, they were selling back their entitlement. So that was direct compensation. Uh, and the efficiency project was a way of doing that as well. So funding farms or schemes of farms to do infrastructure pro projects that would improve their efficiency and giving part of their say water savings back to government to contribute to the recovery process. So the issue around distribution comes to the irrigator themselves is compensated, but where that water is then taken out of the system and there might be flow on impacts to say the person who sells them chemical or um, other inputs to their farming business, you know, they might have, um, that, that's where there has been an argument that those people haven't been well compensated. And that's why there has been a tendency to do more of the efficiency projects rather than the direct buyback, because it's seen to be able to provide some reinvestment back into the regional communities to help offset the impacts to other businesses in the supply chain. I guess we are over time. Thank you, Susan, uh, for excellent presentation. And uh, we can keep uh, the discussion going on. And, and I'm sure people are waiting there for, to have lunch. <laughs> and for us, probably we will not have lunch. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you all uh, uh, for joining us. So we have uh, sessions also after the lunch. Uh, please join us as well. Thank you.